seven questions this morning, uh, and I shall try to answer them, but you're more than welcome to dispute my answer uh, once you put your hand up at the end of this. So the first question is, <clears throat> why did Italy take quite so long to become an independent nation? Officially, of course, the it, Kingdom of Italy started in 1861, but I prefer to use the 1871 date, which was when Rome was included, um, which means that this year is the 150th anniversary of the integrated Italy. Uh, and compared with Spain and France, Britain, Russia, most of the main countries of Europe were already well independent and uh, united. Um, of course, there are a lot of, been, a lot of new countries since then, but nevertheless, it is quite surprising that Italy took quite so long. Um, and my first big of an answer is, uh, well, why bother? Because was Italy all that attractive, either to the people already in it, who would look around and see, shall we turn this into a single nation? Uh, famously, Napoleon, who had the chance to do it, said it too long, about 800 miles long, which is about the same as Britain, in fact, but nevertheless, it is awkward shape. Um, then the, there is the fact that it's a 33% mountain. It is a seriously rough country. Um, and if you think of the, uh, the road from Florence to Bologna, for instance, the Futa Pass is nearly 3,000 feet high, which is significantly higher than our own dear Dramocta Pass of the A9. So you have to realize the difficulty of communications across Italy. Uh, next, it's only 20% arable. In other words, it's seriously short of decent growing land, uh, and for that matter, also of uh, grazing land. So uh, it always had a food problem. Um, and along with that other natural features, it also had seriously big marshes, famously the Pontine marshes, uh, which were huge and uh, uh, Julius Caesar failed to, uh, to drain them. Uh, Mussolini made a, a, a good attempt at it. But there are also big marshes around Naples and Ravenna. Uh, and following from that, you have the disease problem. Um, the marshes uh, produced uh, mosquitoes and malaria was therefore a common problem, particularly when Italy was invaded from the north the German soldiers, for instance, who frequently invaded it back in the 900s, 1000s, and so on, um, frequently their troops died of malaria, and several emperors died of malaria when they took troops into Italy. Then we have earthquakes as another problem. Uh, there have been roughly 4,000 earthquakes in the last 40 odd years, um, and some of them very serious, like the Ravenna one, uh, killed 70,000 people. So uh, earthquakes are a problem. And uh, it's still got four working volcanoes, including one that is spouting today as we speak. Um, and then the rivers aren't a particularly good lot of rivers that Italy has. The Po is the only one that, that had any uh, capacity for navigation, about 100 miles of navigation. Most of the other rivers were failures when it came to uh, getting boats up. Um, if you take, for instance, the Tiber, the, the Tiber is quite a short river. Of course, it comes straight down from the mountains, as most of the rivers apart from the Po do in Italy, and then has a, a quick dash to the sea, taking with it huge amounts of silt, with the result that any port that was built for Rome that kept moving uh, a couple of half miles every, every now and then further out to sea, because because there was such a build-up. Uh, similarly, if you take the Arno, which is an important river going through both Florence and Pisa, of course, um, the boat stopped being able to get up to Florence in the early Middle Ages, really. It, be, it became very difficult uh, because of the amount of silt brought down by the Arno. Uh, and then Pisa started getting blocked up. Um, and then the port of Pisa started getting blocked up. So it's the same difficulty. Uh, and Italy lacked the sort of rivers that other countries have that sort of helped to bind it together. Uh, and of the physical things, finally, 
uh, I'd like to suggest the sheer length of the coastline. It has an enormous coastline. If you if you add up all the ins and outs, you know, um, uh, as something like uh, nearly 4,000 miles of coastline, which resulted in frequent invasions. I mean, first of all, you've got the Greeks who came and plonked cities like Naples and Nice, which was then Italian, uh, and Syracuse, and so uh, uh, dozens of, of significant cities uh, built by the Greeks on the coastline of Italy and Sicily. Um, but then we have the invasions of the of the Celts, the Goths, the Huns, the the, the Germans, of course, the Franks, the Germans, the Normans, the Arabs, significantly, who captured Sicily and bits of Italy for a while. The Normans, more recently, the Albanians, who've been an absolute pest, asylum seeking, uh, and the current pest, of course, uh, if you'll forgive my saying so, it's a bad word, perhaps. Uh, are the African asylum seekers coming across in rib boats in large numbers from North Africa to the coast of Italy. So so we have a, a, a long sort of problem of, of Italy being always invaded. And then also if we think of the of the raw materials that Italy has, it's not strong. We've seen already it wasn't good at producing wheat and basic uh, corn stuff. Uh, cold in the coal in the north, but not not uh, not vast quantities. Timber. Well, the the Romans cut down most of the trees pretty early on in the Roman Empire, uh, and the trees didn't grow again. The usual problem with erosion was, um, and goats eating the baby trees. Um, so again, Italy was seriously seriously short of wood. When the Venetians had to build a navy, they had to get wood from Slovenia and places like that. So. Uh, the only thing Italy is really strong in providing is marble, of course, and uh, the raw materials for concrete. Very good at that. Salt, okay. Rome had salt. That was one of its good ideas. The marshes at the mouth of the Tiber were salt flats. So finally, we come to a non-physical cause, and that is Rome. In one word, you could say Rome was the thing that stopped Italy becoming a nation. Because Roman, Rome was so powerful in itself. And of course, it set about conquering Italy. But in the moment when it was conquering Italy, say around about um, 200 BC, when it had control of Italy, it didn't stop. It didn't st they didn't think of staying, right, we've conquered Italy, let's call this place Italy and be a nation. Now, the Romans charged on into North Africa and Greece, and it became a Roman Empire, not an Italian Empire. Uh, and even when Rome was uh, several times destroyed uh, by the Goths and Huns and so on, um, it resurrected itself uh, as an impediment to Italy becoming united. Uh, first of all, it, it created itself as the head of Christianity. It, it snatched the, the chance, using uh, St. Peter as the, as the focus, to become uh, the headquarters of Christianity, uh, and even when it effectively lost that, Constantinople started to call itself the New Rome, and then Moscow started to call itself the Third Rome. So, so the image of of Rome was extremely strong from the church point of view, and then if we look at it from the political point of view, it it was because Julius Caesar, Caesar was the name, Caesar became Kaiser, Caesar became Tsar. That the image of Rome, uh, ruled by the Caesars, was so strong that it was revived again. There was the, sec there was the Charlemagne Empire, Empire in 800, <clears throat> and then what was called the Second Roman Empire, um, which was German-led uh, in the 900s, which also became the First Reich. So we have the First Reich, Second Reich, Third Reich, and the First Roman Empire. Uh, the Holy Roman was the second, and the third, of course, the third Roman Emperor, Empire was Mussolini. So, so this this image of Rome was was much much stronger than the physical city itself. It uh, and it was an impediment, therefore, to Rome. So, <clears throat> I now move to question two, <clears throat> which is given what we've been talking about, what was the alternative to having a United Nation? Um, and, and the answer is. The city state. And what I'm going to suggest to you as an answer is that is the city state was a, a very good formula. 
<clears throat> we have some of them still today. If you think of Singapore, it's a very, very successful city-state. So was Hong Kong until fairly recently. <clears throat> and now so is Dubai, although it's got nasty little set candles going. Monte Carlo, the city-state is quite a clever sort of arrangement. Um, and places like Amsterdam are now beginning to sort of follow that route. Uh, having a, a creative city that, that does things that isn't just a capital city, nor is it just part of a nation. Hamburg, the same. Hamburg was a city-state for many years, uh, and again is, is, is a sort of city-state still. So the city-state formula was extremely successful in Italy when Italy had no nation. If we take, first of all, Venice, Venice was a, and a, I apologize for using the word successful because you might query it, but I, I, I haven't got the time to say what success means, uh, and you could, you could judge that. But, but Venice is, is, was an incredibly successful city state, uh, which lasted for a thousand years, had its own little empire as well, um, and was successful creatively. Same with Florence, a brilliant, brilliant city that was a, a city-state um, for uh, 500 years, really, uh, before it became Tuscany. Milan, another brilliant city-state, okay, was the capital of Lombardy, notionally, uh, and Genoa. You could go on with a number of very, very successful city-states that persevered, many of them, right up to nasty Napoleon arriving in the 1800s. So question three it just follows that up with the question, why were the republics? Now, most of these city-states went at least through some period of being republics, which when you consider the medieval and early modern world was a remarkable, remarkable feature because where else were there any republics? Okay, republicanism had been invented uh, without that word, by the ancient Greeks, really, with Athens and Corinth and so on, being city-states that were very successful and creative. Um, but in Italy, city-states were very frequently um, republics as well, until they were taken over by dictators of one kind or another. And particularly, we should say that Venice, Venice was a republic for a thousand years which I think is longer than any other place in the world, city or nation, has been a republic. It holds the world record of for republicanism it, it, until it was uh, conquered by Napoleon, and that was the end of that. Um, ancient Rome had been a republic for 500-odd years. During Florence was a republic for about 300 years. Uh, many of the others were significant republics, functioning with a good regime, based probably on having, if you look at the answer to that, uh, a strong middle class, uh, a chosen method of commerce, a chosen industry, like Florence was based on the woolen industry. It was the woolen industry that paid for Florence Cathedral and funded much of the great art that was produced there. Um, so, so what I want to say is, is that republicanism functioned pretty well uh, at a time long before Let's face it, the, uh, the other, the, the French Republic fell several times and, and the current French Republic isn't all that old since, since 1946. Uh, um, same with modern Italy, Republic has only been since 1940s. And even the U USA is not yet 250 years old as a Republic. So, um, Question four is, how did this produce so many geniuses? Now, I'm not going to dwell on the artists because I'm sure you all are very well aware of the number of, of great painters, uh, sculptors, and architects who uh, functioned in most of these cities. But I'd just like to mention specifically some of the ones that, that were not apparently geniuses, but were, I think. Columbus, for a start, has to be not only a genius, uh, but also a very, very determined uh, man uh, with huge stamina. Uh, and he created the modern world in many respects. It wouldn't happen without him. 
Uh, similarly, Marco Polo from Genoa, um, who explored the land route to China um, and developed the Silk Road concept uh, as, as connecting into Europe uh, and opened up the idea of the East as being uh, a source of wealth, which of course Columba took advantage of, Columbus took advantage of because he thought he could find the, the East by going West. Uh, and also the scientists like Galileo of, of massive novelty and genius, uh, or more modern ones like Marconi, inventors. So uh, philosophers like Aquinas, it had all these. And also uh, from probably brought in by the Arabs, it was the Italians that first developed the, the zero number um, and improved the counting. And of course, it was the Venetians who in, invented double entry bookkeeping and the Medici who invented the modern banking system. Um, and uh, sort of finance became a major industry also in Italy. So all these things, music, of course, I'm not going to mention all the composers because you know them. Um, so why, why was this possible with all these city-states? Well, I, th I think the city-states had a sort of friendly, convivial atmosphere. They, they weren't all that big. People knew each other. Uh, they were small units, but nevertheless, they had the motivation to show off themselves. So, so their artists, they paid the artists money uh, to provide the, them with an image. Um, and they fostered the arts of all forms uh, and created magnificent uh, architecture. And they encouraged each other and they competed with each other. So I think that that is the, the, the possibility that, that, a, that small nation states were better at doing that sort of thing than nation states in many respects. So now, now question five. Um, <clears throat> Question five is divided into two parts, since they both cover much the same subject in a way. How is it that Italian food has become the most popular form of food throughout the modern world if you just take the restaurants and so on outside Italy itself and take the Chinese ones except in China and the Italian ones except in India, as you would say. Now, Italy does now with pizza parlors, uh, pasta shops, coffee shops, and ice cream shops. It is, has the largest number of Italian food outlets throughout the world compared with anywhere else. Now, the, the second question that follows on with that, or is involved with that, is was it the medieval diet, so-called, that cr helped create the geniuses, helped give the stamina to the Romans and the Venetians to do for their extraordinary achievements? Now, the answer in the case of Rome is no, straightforward no. The ancient Romans did not have anything remotely like the Mediterranean diet. They, they were largely vegetarian on the whole because there was such a shortage of grazing land um, that, that it, it suited the Romans to, to grow anything they could grow. Uh, on such land, and what they tended to eat, the diet of the of the ancient Romans was basically lentils, very strong, good good solid fruit, but not exactly so much butchering, I would say, beans, olives, of course. Uh, they made bread. Even the the thing we call the focaccia was invented by the ancient Romans, though none of the other ones that I can't remember, like bruschetta, I can't remember which is which. Um, uh, and they did also invent something like prosciutto. Um, they had ham. They had something like salami. And sal, of course, Rome was stronger than salt. And sal is salt. And salami is, is salt used to preserve meat. So uh, if you think of Julius Caesar, he had something like a bowl of minestrone. But had he, for instance, asked the waiter to sprinkle some Parmesan cheese on it, he'd have had to wait 1,200 years. Um, similarly, uh, okay, the, 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 in the Roman Empire, when they started getting really luxurious, they started eating things like dormice and snails and so on, and exotic things that cropped up from all, all over the Roman world. Uh, but they still didn't have 
chips, tomatoes, none of those things, of course. They, there was a thing called lasagna because lasagna just means uh, layers. Um, uh, but but it wasn't lasagna as we know it because uh, of course it wouldn't have any uh, tomato sauce to make it edible. So if we look if we look at the the expansion of the Roman diet, um, by the 10th century they'd got spinach for something new, uh, they got aubergine coming from somewhere, uh, and they had the first cheap cheese. They, they realised they could make cheese from sheep wool, uh, and that is ricotta, of course, which is now part of it. The Roman diet. Um, uh, the Arabs brought, they came around 800, 900, uh, they brought lemons and oranges, of course, which was uh, a novelty, but that didn't, that couldn't serve the rest of Italy. Uh, they, they also brought sugar, they grew sugar for a while. Um, there was the beginning of durum wheat, which is the best stuff for making pasta, but really, pasta had not made any progress at all. Uh, beer had beer came over the Alps to Milan, made from hops. Um, and in 997, we have to have a date for the production of the first pizza. But of course, still no tomato sauce and no buffalo mozzarella or anything like that. Um, so um, we come to the next sort of change of diet which is mostly due, of course, to Christopher Columbus bringing plants back from the, uh, across the Atlantic. That brought at long last in the tomatoes, which, of course, is one of the, the prime ingredients of all the, the Italian food, uh, plus potatoes, plus courgettes. Um, maize came from somewhere, I'm not clear about that, uh, which enabled uh, them to produce polenta, which became a sort of popular Italian thing. Yes. Um, and there were new wines arriving. Prosecco was invented about this time. How would we do without Prosecco? In a little village up near Venice. Uh, Chianti, of course, began to be called Chianti at this time as outside Florence. And Pino Grigio uh, came from the, the Grey monks, the Cistercian monks, who started that in northern Italy and elsewhere. Uh, and then came the buffaloes. They realized that buffalo, buffaloes, there were buffaloes in, in the northern Italy, but um, the kings of Naples realized that if they came down to the marshes around Naples, uh, they would chomp away. And it, they invented mozzarella cheese, which, of course, is again a popular additive, all these things. So, uh, and then we've still got more to come. Um, 18th century, of course, was coffee. It was the Venetians that fetched coffee from Alexandria, coffee that had been grown probably in Abyssinia. Uh, but Italy did introduce uh, coffee, uh, um, which is subsequently taken over as, as if Italy was the place for coffee. And then comes rice, rice fairly late. Now, rice did exist in Italy um, uh, as a medicine, but was very, very expensive until Cavour, the Prime Minister of Piedmont, uh, did some irrigation canals. The, the first attempt at canals of any kind, really, in Italy, um, to produce paddy fields in northern Italy. Uh, and so we have rice at a normal price, uh, risotto at long last. Uh, and then follows at the end of the 19th century, at long last comes spaghetti and macaroni, which, which of course it needed machines really to make into a popular food. Uh, and the machine making um, spaghetti was outside Bologna, uh, and uh, 1894 is the date of that particular thing. So uh, we have in the 20th century still the novelty, the Italians being proactive in terms of developing foods. Early in the 20th century, we have the espresso machine, and because Italy invented machines like that, the cappuccino machines and so on, it has snatched a hunk of the world market. Uh, and ice cream gelato, of course, was, was, made, uh, was, was invented all over the place, but the, but the Italian version uh, became popular and manufactured. So all these things, what I think we're saying is the answer is the Italians were good at grabbing opportunities in this field, although they really started off with none of it. And when the Italian diaspora started, uh, 
they were proactive in uh, the Italian food industry uh, wherever they went as, as, uh, as moving to Britain and America and so on. Now, question six, you may be horrified by this. What's the clock? Um, why was Italy successful in producing the most, the biggest and nastiest criminal network in world history? Uh, in other words, the Mafia. Um, the Mafia is first heard of in 1864, funnily enough, which means when Italy was three years old. So that is not insignificant. Um, uh, the Mafia was also, nobody really knows what it means and uh, the various versions of that. Nobody knows really what caused it. But one of the causes was the, the kind of end of feudalism in Sicily. The fact that the, the large, uh, huge farms of the aristocracy were broken up and split up amongst the peasants. So that something like 20,000 peasant farms in Italy sprouted instead of 2,000. Um, and there was no effort to increase the police force. And of all things, of all types of growing that it is easy to ruin, then a lemon farm is one of the easiest because you come and chop down a lemon tree and it'd be 20 years or something before the poor old farmer would get a crop again from lemons. Um, and so it, it, it seed that the, the, the black veil uh, of peasant farmers, particularly lemon farmers and uh, cattle farmers, because again, it's easy to destroy cattle, although that would, could be replaced in a couple of years, but, it's, but it is a big enough threat to make all um, peasants likely to just pay the money to the mafia. So, so that's one of the theories. Um, but again, it's a question of grabbing the opportunities and, and desperation, because the Italians would always be poor unless they worked hard. And that is true of the city-states we've seen so far. It's also true of the, of the early nation. Um, the, the Italians just had to be, to be proactive and to seize opportunities. Um, and, and when the mafia joined the diaspora and moved into <coughs> United States, they saw the opportunity of prohibition, and then they saw the opportunity of the drug traffic. So it, it, it's a warped example. The mafia is a warped example of, of the efficiency and determination um, and it, their own form of nasty integrity. Um, that is fairly typical of the Italians. They, they all had to work hard to get anywhere, whether it was in peaceful activity or in crime. Now, a final question really is why, uh, not too bad for time, um, why did Italy as a nation, counting it from 1861 or 1871, which you be like, why has it been a less successful nation? I apologize again for using the word successful because you can make your own judgment about what it means. Why, why um, has it not performed as well as you might expect from the brilliant background that we have talked about of city-states? And I think um, one of the reasons was that when a nation is founded, it, it has the first experience of being ra rather hoity-toity, sort of being, you know, what, my goodness, no, we're a nation, we'll have to do something about it. Uh, we'll have to have an empire, of course. <coughs> that not uncommon feature. So what do they do? They have six wars. They go to six wars in the period since 1870-odd. Um, they were greedy for an empire. Uh, when... Uh, they would have been much more sensible to consolidate Italy, to, to, to rely on its qualities, to develop its industries, and so on. So, um, <clears throat> let's consider briefly. Get rid of the phone, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, first of all, Tunisia, the obvious one. They uh, went to war to try and pinch Tunisia in northern Africa. 
in uh, 1877. So that's the, that's the first one. Um, then they started moving further afield to Eritrea and Abyssinia, and they captured Mogadishu. Now, if you imagine, see, consider modern Mogadishu. It is the nastiest, mixed up, horrible place uh, almost in the world. Uh, and Somaliland, which became an Italian colony, uh, similarly uh, a disaster area. So um, Italy's wars didn't do Italy any good. Um, and, and they didn't do the world any good either. They didn't do Africa any good. Um, and uh, the, the, the sort of colony at the bottom of the Persian Gulf uh, was really not much use to them and not much use to anybody else. Uh, we then have in the 1910-11 sort of period, the scuffles with Turkey. Uh, as they saw Turkey in decline, they started to pinch bits of the Turkish Empire. Um, they captured the Dodecanese Islands, that's the Greek islands of the Eastern Aegean, um, and thought that was clever. It didn't do them a great deal of good. Uh, and then, of course, they went for Libya, uh, Tripolitania, as it was called. Uh, and Libya has been an absolute disaster ever since, really. Um, so uh, they weren't doing themselves any good. Uh, and by and large, these wars were expensive. Um, and different politicians were in control with the result that lots of changes of government. Every time a war was lost, they would change government, of course. And then we have their, their entry, their late entry into World War I. Uh, okay, they entered World War I on the winning side, where you would expect them maybe to, to get some benefit. But of course, their army wasn't even good enough to cope with the Austrians, let alone the Germans. Um, and uh, they, uh, they, they lost large numbers of, of men in the attempt to seize the South Tyrol. Okay, the, the, the South Tyrol uh, was a, a largely German-speaking area, but there were also Italians, the, the Trentino, that sort of area in the, in the north east of Italy. Uh, and it cost them a great deal. Um, they were also casting their eyes on Albania, which became one of the next targets. And so we also come to the starting of World War II. Now, the Italians, of course, along with the Japanese, were the people that started World War II, Mussolini, with his uh, disobedience to the United Nations, uh, attacking Abyssinia again. No, it was great fun. Uh, King Victor Emmanuel III became an emperor. Great stuff. He was emperor of Abyssinia as well as king of Italy and king of Albania. This was the third Roman Empire. Total disaster, of course, because Mussolini's troops again and his arms were really not capable of, of holding it. And they stirred up a war which, which they couldn't afterwards control. Uh, they'd given Hitler the, the chance to, to go to war. Uh, w with w much more easily th than he would have been able to uh, if Mussolini hadn't started it, uh, disobedience to the United Nations. Uh, and once Mussolini started taking his troops into Greece, of course, he was in deep, deep trouble. And that was really the beginning of the end of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and so, so we come to the sort of uh, the final stages of, of looking on um, the Roman Republic, um, which is now about 46 years old. So it was, came from 1946. So that's uh, uh, 80 years old now, coming up. Um, <clears throat> uh, and and Italy, Italian politics has, since independence has always been bedeviled by the lack of uh, camaraderie between the North and the South. The, the South having totally different interests from the North, the South being much poorer than the North, the North being much more industrialized, uh, and the, the problem of getting stable governments and stable parties. There were far too many uh, parties involved. If you look at the number of prime ministers in the early stages uh, of Italian unification in the 1870s and 80s, some of the prime ministers would only last for a few hundred days. 
left on the days uh, before they would have to resign. Uh, and there were 50 prime ministers in about 50 years, um, leading to very unstable governments, um, which were easily voted out. And, and that just to some extent survived, as has corruption. Now, I should have mentioned corruption perhaps earlier, because I think that also contributed to the rise of the mafia. The mafia being in Sicily, and that having been in the kingdom of Naples and Sicily, uh, and and that southern area, mainly the kingdom, ex-kingdom of Naples and Sicily, was bedeviled by corruption. As you know, it was Lord Acton who wrote the history of Naples, and his famous dictum was, uh, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That's what he said about the kingdom of Naples. Um, uh, and corruption s survived at the top. Uh, and that's where, uh, to one extent, it trickled down the classes into the into the mafia, and I think it also trickled down into the political classes, and for that matter, the civil services and everything, particularly in southern Italy, but also in the north. Now, uh, what, what Italy has been good at, of course, is uh, football, um, and it has been uh, successful in the worldwide cooking sense, but one hears that, that Italian cuisine in Italy has, is not really as good as it was. Italy has been very successful still in the world of fashion, uh, particularly from the former city-states like Milan. Um, so in some respects, it, it, has, it, has, it has survived Italy, but, but it has not performed nearly as well as it should have done, even compared with the other cities of Europe. Now, how are we off for time? Not bad, I think. No. Um, <clears throat> we've made it to the 40 minutes. So um, I think that we could see what people think of the answers. Anybody get any comments or questions or observations or whatever? Thank you very much, Oliver. That was really informative. Loads of things I did not know about Italy. Um, so, any comments? Well, you're thinking about it. One of my favourite little subjects, which I've never quite found the answer to, um, which is suitable for the, those of us who are in the third age, is the question mark as to how the doges of Venice, many of them uh, were not given the job of Doge of Venice until they were in their 80s. And quite a few of them survived in office until they were in their 90s. Um, and the famous or infamous Dutch, uh, Doge Dandolo, uh, according to the legend, but probably pretty close to the truth, was 97 when he led the Venetian fleet into Constantinople to capture Constantinople. He allegedly stepped a store and he couldn't see. He was more or less blind. Um, aged 97. Now, what was it that the Venetians had to eat in their diet? How did they act, you know, keep going in old age in such a remarkable way? I don't know. Maybe it was the fish. <laughs> well, um, I hope that's hope for us all then in our 80s and our 90s <laughs> to be so active, uh, definitely. Any any questions or observation that from, I know it's difficult when you're sort of on a screen. I, I, yeah, I would like to ask something about the city-state of Venice. Was that just that little inner circle of Venice as we know it? Or did it include these little surrounding islands like uh, Murano and where the airport is now and such like? Uh, yes, because of course Venice was an island, was built on a few wee islands itself anyway. Yeah. But, I mean, Venice is, a, is an extraordinary example of the de determination. If you think of the way it was started, people wading out into the shallow waters of the sea 
uh, and digging in poles. It, it showed incredible determination to build that city, uh, only equaled by St. Petersburg, and that was done with the whip. In the case of Venice, it was done by, by volunteers. Uh, and yes, of course, they did capture an empire. They captured, uh, again, of course, it's an example of, of Italian independence failing. Venice never thought of capturing the rest of Italy. Uh, okay, it captured Padua. Uh, it moved inland a bit. But it never thought of capturing the whole of Italy. But it had an empire which included um, most of the Aegean islands, Crete, um, uh, and outposts in the North, in the Black Sea. Because that was that was one of the bad things it did. Of course, it was Genoa who who built a, uh, an outpost in the Black Sea, which was where the Black Death arrived, and that was it was Genoese ships that brought the Black Death. Nobody knows exactly whether it was the bugs or the rats or whatever. There's arguments over that. But there's no doubt that it was Genoa that brought the Black Death from their outpost on the Black Sea. So, um, it, yeah, in answer to your question, uh, Italy had many, many islands. It was a maritime empire. It was a seagoing empire of huge strength. As you know, uh, Venice built its arsenal. Uh, and the Venetian arsenal is one of the first examples of uh, modern manufacturing technique uh, in, in the world, in, in the fact that, you know, they kept all the spare parts, they kept the right number of spare parts so that a Venetian galley came in to the arsenal, they stuck a new mast in and all the other new bits it might need and sent it out again very quick. A highly, highly efficient operation uh, and nothing else like it in Europe. 